good evening everybody and welcome to our midweek service. Tonight we continue with our theme which is United We Stand, Divided We Fall, which we've been doing for a little while now. And our text tonight is the whole chapter of 1 Corinthians 3, 22 verses. I'm not necessarily going to go through every single verse, of course, in quite that way, but I do want to bring out the most salient points tonight to cover our theme, which is building a firm foundation. For indeed, that is how we will stand if we have the right foundation and we continue with it. So let's see where this text takes us tonight and I'll pray just before we begin. Father God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that none of it was written by chance, that all of it has been put into the canon of scripture so that we have your truth and we can hear your voice. Lord, it's your written word, your voice written down for us. So help us, we pray, to really honour it and see it for what it is. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and through the power of the Holy Spirit we pray. Amen. I think it was some time ago when I mentioned during a morning service, where we said we were together of course in the actual building, I remember telling a story about a retired couple who had ploughed all their life savings into buying a new build property in Crete or Cyprus, I can't remember where. And what happened was that the house itself never got fully built. The foundations collapsed underneath it because they had no insurance and the builders were a bunch of unscrupulous rogues. They absolutely lost everything. They're heart wrenching stories, these sorts of things. People work their whole lives trying to get a bit of retirement at the end and then they lose it all. And, you know, the foundations, as I said, were so bad that they, everything else went with it. And, you know, I think church can be the same. The foundation is so critical to everything else. Now, in Paul's time in the Corinthian churches, many were getting focused in on what you could call personalities. Some followed Apollos, some Paul. Some Cephas, verses 4 and verses 22. And in so doing, a misemphasis was occurring within the church. And because of that, things were failing. Now, of course, Paul being the apostle, the man who planted many churches, was deeply concerned about what was going on. And Paul, the man who often said that he was not a good speaker, someone who was perhaps regarded as weak when he met publicly with others and spoke, is actually very strong in in this passage here. And of course, Paul was much better at speaking and much stronger than, of course, some of his critics would say that he was. But these words here are pretty strong and he he uses them to try to correct them, to make them see where they're at in the situation in which they find themselves. So he calls them worldly. That's the NIV translation. But actually, the Greek word there is sarx, which is where we get the word fleshy from. It's all to do with the sinful nature. It's to do with carnality, verse 1. To behave the way they were was carnal, fleshy, worldly. So they were not acting spiritually when they gave themselves into this particular way of being and thinking. Not in any way at all were they being spiritual. And so bad were they that Paul even presses it further and says they were not even ready for spiritual things. Not even now, even in the situation they found themselves in, bearing in mind his history of teaching them the right things in the past. So to put it another way, he uses this phrase, the church there was not ready for spiritual, solid food, spiritually speaking. They were, they were just not even really ready, just about ready for spiritual milk. So simply, they were like babies 
They were like infants, because of course babies and infants drink milk. Paul's being very strong here in verse 2. And so their behaviour is something that is far removed from what Christ died for them for and what Christ has given them through his spirit. Full adulthood and maturity in Christ and in the faith is what they lacked, but still they quarrelled and still they were jealous over personalities. Now I had a look at the word quarrelling in this passage. It's quite interesting. It's about having an affection for dispute, an affection for dispute. It was about having a readiness for a quarrel and for making strife. So it's almost as though they actually liked doing this, had an affection for it. So the quarrelling was bad enough on its own, but to actually want it and have an affection for it is even more concerning. And I also looked up the word jealous here, or jealousy, and at its base meaning, it has that sense of boiling over or bubbling over, bubbling up, a kind of zealous jealousy. So again, it's that kind of jealousy which isn't just sort of just there. It's something that's within a person, moving up, and they've almost got a zeal for it. Bubbling, zealous, jealousy. So it's serious stuff. And to put it simply, it all comes down to Christian immaturity. That's what it is. It's plain and simple immaturity. It is to act in a fleshy way, to act as though they're mere men, verse 3b, rather than the spiritual people Christ made them to be. If I was to say to you the word internet, I'm sure there'd be a shade of views that you have about it. On the one hand, it's used for the most awful things. And on the other hand, it's a great resource with wonderful things on it that are so helpful for people. At the touch of a button, you can find out things that years ago would have taken months of research to do. But you know, one of the things that is of concern to me about the internet is is this really, and it's very relevant for the 21st century. A quick look on the internet will surely, if you're looking at using the right search engine, of course, you'll find Christian superstars, to put it that way. If the average Christian types in something to do with, you know, Christian teaching or whatever, the chances are you'll come across a Christian superstar, to put it that way. Men and women who are expert speakers with large followings, who have a certain charisma about them. They're also funny, so they've got that attraction element involved as well. They've got the latest equipment, big bands, new buildings and music and everything like that. And of course, you can get on the more local level in an average church, other things just the same really as well. It's very easy for people to get clicky and to focus in on particular persons or personalities because that person suits their own preferences or whatever. You know what I'm trying to say. Now, let me just make it clear, my friends. I am not saying for one moment we shouldn't look on the internet and listen to speakers and stuff. Of course I'm not. And I'm not saying for one moment that, a Christ, that those Christians are not of God. How could I possibly know that? And I would never say such a thing. What kind of person would I be to even make those statements? But what I am saying is that it is so very possible for people to end up following men rather than their Messiah. It's so easy to focus in on a person rather than on Jesus. And it's very, very subtle, these things, because no one necessarily turns out that way, but it's easy to slide into it. I think there's always been people following people within the church. But as we know, ultimately what counts is Jesus, Jesus alone. That might sound like the most obvious statement in the world, but making sure we maintain that and keep going with that is not always quite as straightforward as saying it. No one else matters other than him, because we are of Christ and Christ is of God, verse 22. Therefore, comparatively, 
Everything else is unimportant, verse 7b. On a personal note, and this is something I try to do regularly, inwardly I ask myself, am I ministering for his glory or mine? And are we together building our ministries here for our glory or his? And are we truth speakers? Are we a people who will not compromise on truth or, or, or we're not in danger of softening things and becoming progressive or contemporaneous because that would make us fit in more with society? I think that's always a temptation, especially for big ministries. So these are important questions to weigh up. And the truth is, if we ever lose sight of Christ as the foundation, verse 11, then we are lost. And we will be lost, yes, because we will no longer be building the true church that Jesus wants, but instead creating something else entirely different. And that will not glorify him at all. As the text, text teaches, Paul planted the seed and Apollos watered it, but it is God who makes it grow, verse 6. And I think verse 6 is obviously very linked into verse 9. We, every single one of us, like Paul and Apollos back then, are fellow workers under God. That's who we are. We're not just people who are to turn up on a Sunday morning. We're fellow workers with this glorious gospel that we have been given. You see, we each have a role to play. It's not about me. It's not about Clive. It's not about Derek or John or Brenda or Barbara and the leadership team therein. They are part, I am part, of a great big wider whole. We're fellow workers with everybody else in the church and, of course, the church worldwide, wherever she might exist. It's not about the ones who are up the front. It's not about the personalities so called. So the question is this. What is it that you have that might be like a seed in this church? And what might you be able to give that waters that seed in this church so that it grows? Simply, what are your gifts? What are your abilities? What are your talents, my friend? Because I think the Lord wants you and me together, all of us, to use what he has given us to the glory of his name in this place. A little while ago, Nikki, Emily and Anaya, they went uh, out somewhere in the car. I can't quite remember where, where they ended up. But they came across this area which had an incredible field with sunflowers in it, all fully grown. I didn't go with them, unfortunately, but they went. And Emily took a picture of it as well, actually. And it was just a stunning place. Fields upon fields of beautiful sunflowers. Really tall, brilliant yellow, and so on. I think you'd agree that is a potent image. And something all of us would remember if we'd seen it. It's notable in verse 9, God says we are God's field. God's building. And that's a, I think, that's, as I said, that's a powerful image. God's field. Clearly, that links into that idea of seed and water that is back in verse 6 and 7. What God is doing is he's planting these seeds because we are his field and he's watering them through various means. But he is the one who makes it grow, as we know. So fields start with seeds and through the watering, the growth comes. So that sunflower field image, OK, it's just something that is a human thing to think about. But I think if we can sort of spiritually think about the grandeur and the wonder of what God is trying to do in us, his people, his field, then I think that is an amazing thing to hold on to. Because ultimately, you see, God's growing it because he wants a glorious final crop 
to come. And I think seeds have already been planted in us and through us so that field can develop and grow because God hasn't placed us here just so we stay the same. He has worked to work in us so that his plans unfold. The reality is if we all discern our roles and our gifts and give ourselves over to them, then God's miracle will come. And I often go on about context, so apologies, I'm mentioning context again. But let's not forget that 1 Corinthians 3 is in context with 1 Corinthians 12 and vice versa. And what's 1 Corinthians 12 about? It's about body ministry, body ministry. It's about all of us, which actually enforces, I think, a point I've just made. So these passages together are each other's contexts. So what God is doing, what God is building is is about us, verse 9, not the brickwork. It's about us released into ministry and mission, touching the world. And through him, it is possible, in spite of all our doubts, worries, and our sense of weakness and our limited humanity. God can do a work, is doing a work, just as he's done it throughout the centuries in people just like you and me. You know, my hope is when I get to the end of my life, God will look at what I have done. And when he sets it alight with fire, verse 14 to 15, it will not completely combust into nothing. But there will be, as it were, as you dig through the ashes, jewels in there, real jewels, things that have remained, things that I've done for God through his strength that will remain. I hope when God judges what I've done, it will stand his test and prove itself to be a durable and precious work. For the day, that day of his return will bring it all to light, verse 13. And I truly hope There'll be something there that God can say, there it is, Simon. There it is, your durable, precious work for me. And if I'm even more honest, I want God's reward. Verses 14 and back to front, verse 9. Don't you want God's reward, my friend? I don't think we often talk in these terms because... I think it sounds as though we're somehow getting something by works. Now, all of this is given, any reward is given by grace. But I want that. I want the Lord to be able to say, Simon, here's my reward to you. And I want us to be a people together where our works stand that test, where God looks at Aldwick Baptist Church and says, well done, my people. And then he gives us those rewards accordingly afterwards wouldn't that be something that day when together God gives out his gracious rewards to you and me you see because what God's actually building is us together because we're his temple as well verse 16 and actually on an individual level God says that about you and me a few chapters later in 6 Verse 19, you and I, we are God's temple, the temple of the Holy Spirit. So at the end of this sermon, as I said, I'm not going to go through every verse, and so I didn't. But I think there's some things in here worth considering. But here's a summing up, as it were, of what I've said, uh, with a few couple of extra things in there. And this summary is about how can we be careful in how we build to use a phrase from verse 10b. How can we be careful in how we build? First one is obvious. Jesus is the foundation. We must not let anyone else be. Two, it's a continuous focus on the Messiah, on him, not on man. Three, It's about recognising our gifts and abilities and using them accordingly. Four, it's about planting and watering. It's about getting behind, I guess as part of that, what someone else is doing 
and blessing it. Five, it's about truth and not wavering from it or watering it down. Six, it's about boasting in God alone, never men, verse 21. Seven, it's about God's glory and not ours. I think it is these things that will help us build a firm foundation, build on that. Of course, the firm foundation is Jesus Christ, our Lord himself. And if we do all these things, unlike that house in Crete or Cyprus or wherever it was, we will last to the praise and glory of Jesus. God bless you and thanks for listening tonight. Amen. Oh,